He is the one in whom God's expression of his being comes to us. That what we're dealing with in him is nothing less than God's self-presentation in love and mercy. That the very character of God as love is expressed in the person of Christ in a way that is decisive for humanity, for the destiny of the creation, and for the communication of God to the world. God has communicated his reality supremely and unsurpassably in Christ. And one of the ways we will speak of him then, speak of Christ, we will say that he is God's word, or that he is the Son proper to God's being. I want to go into this in too much detail, but it's, I think until about the 18th century there was no real understanding that in the conception of a child the man contributes the seed and the woman contributes the egg. All the way through the centuries there was an understanding that in fact the substance of the Son was grounded in the substance of the Father. And all that the woman contributed was a context in which this substance could become different from the Father. There was no real understanding of the role of the woman as actually contributing, as we might say now, genetically to the, the character of a, of a person. So very, very physically and almost literally, the Son is integral to the body of the Father. Now, transposing this, obviously with qualifications or difference and so on, it was a way in which people could speak about the Son of God being inseparable from the being of God. And so the two categories that come to be used of the status of Christ is to speak of him as the Son or the Word of God. Now, Lindbeck says, what you have there in this Rule 3, Christological Maximalism, you have the dynamo. This is what drives Christology. This is why Christology takes the shape that it does. You've got to find this maximum estimate, and you have to do so in ways that respect Principle 1, and that respect Principle 2. So you can't make him into a second god. You can't make him into a part of God. Whatever you say about him has to be guided by his status as the one in whom the oneness of God comes to us. Equally, you have to respect the humanity that's there. So let's just look at, at the, the closing paragraphs on that particular page. This is after the, the three paragraphs there. Principle one reaffirms Jewish monotheism as a control on Christological statements. Principle two forbids you to say things which suggest that his humanity is only a mask or an appearance. And principle three is like a dynamo which impels Christology to speak about Jesus in ways which do justice to his unsurpassable significance in God's dealings with humanity. So under the impact of principle three, Christology has to find the highest possible account of Jesus' significance, and therefore of his identity, while respecting principle one, and not making Jesus either into a part of God, God being immaterial does not have composing parts, or into a second God, God's being is one and simple. At the same time, this maximum significance must be compatible with a strong affirmation that in him full human reality is present. Now, what, what this gives you, and I think the value of this, it enables you to say why in classical Christology Jesus is said to be of one being with the Father, so inseparable from God's reality, but at the same time of one being with us, inseparable from our reality. And you have to make both of these statements in order to get Jesus right. Now you're probably saying to yourself, 
how can you make both of those statements about this one person? Are they not incompatible with one another? As soon as you begin to ask that question, you're into deep Christology. That is exactly where the crucial point is in Christology. Now, you're all getting tired. I can see it in your eyes. There's, there's a glaze comes over people's eyes at a certain point. But I want you to think about when you were at school and you were perhaps in a science laboratory and there was a pair of scales in this laboratory. Maybe they don't have scales in laboratories anymore, but a pair of scales with two pans. Now my guess, my guess is that you are thinking of divinity and humanity as balancing aspects on a pair of scales. So, the more he's divine, the less he's human. If he really was divine, how could he be human? Or, the more human he is, well, the less divine he can be. So if you want to have full humanity, you purchase it at the expense of his divinity. If you want a fully human Christ, well you have to sacrifice the divine Christ. Or if you want the divine Christ, you have to sacrifice the human Christ. What you're doing spontaneously and instinctively, and there's nothing wrong with you when you do this, it just means you're an ordinary human being. <laughs> this is the way we think, we set things in contrastive relationships. What you're doing is thinking that if you have divine action, this interferes with human action. You are placing God as one thing that conflicts with the creaturely. So for example, if I'm standing here, you're not. If you're sitting there, I'm not. It's either you or me, kid. Okay? One of us is doing it, the other one isn't. The key to the whole thing is that God is not one thing among other things. Your language will suggest that God is one thing among other things. But God by definition is not one fact among other facts in the world. This is the trouble, for example, with Richard Dawkins and, and the, the whole new atheist movement. They, they're, they're simply convinced that if you're talking about God, you're talking about another thing in reality. And God is not that kind of thing. Now, all the time in Christology, the temptation is to think that if you are to have full divine presence, this must interfere with full, creaturely human presence. And the key to it all is to recognize that God is not one thing among others. For example, think of a chessboard. On any one square, there can only be one piece. You cannot have, unless you're three years old, <laughs> you cannot have two pieces on the one square. God is not one piece among other chess pieces. For example, you're, this takes us into, and there's too, too much to go into today. When I raise my hand, I'm acting. But for me to act, there must be another action making it possible. And the action that makes it possible is God making me be. Now this is what Thomas Aquinas calls God is being the primary cause. God makes be. In such a way that John McDade as a secondary cause can do things. So I can think, I can feel, I can raise my hand, I can even do it with that hand as well, I can do the two of them together. <laughs> I have all the, the ability to operate as a person, but underpinning all this is God making me 
B. Now this has some kind of significance for when it comes to Christology. Because a lot of people think, well, if you're dealing with a first century Jew, if you're dealing with someone who thinks that the world is flat, who's never even heard of Glasgow, <laughs> who is limited in his perspective with regard to the third law of thermodynamics, you know, why would anyone want to think that Christ knew the third law of thermodynamics? He is a restricted human being in a particular place and time. But that very operation of him as a secondary cause, a human being who does things, who has his own way of thinking, his own way of feeling, he thinks with the categories of first century Palestinian Judaism. Hmm? You can have that particular restricted quality as long as you recognize that that does not interfere with the union of God's expressiveness that operates through him. You do not have to show that Christ knew everything because he didn't know everything. Okay? Because you have to recognize these, these things. Now this will take us, and we won't go on, we'll maybe just do another five minutes and then I want to open up for some questions and comments because these are quite difficult things and the only way to get round them or to, to get used to them is to talk about them. So that's what we'll do. But I want to draw your attention to uh, page um, 17. Pages 17 and 18 of this. And I, I do commend this to you as something you might like to ponder. It came as a great surprise to me that um, Thomas Aquinas, who was a, a great 13th century medieval theologian, a great, great teacher in the Catholic tradition and a great philosopher as well as, as theologian, he thought that God was present in Christ in three ways. Now, I think no one's ever told me this before, but why does he think this? It turns out to be quite interesting. So on page, um, on page 17, the bottom of the page there, you have a little section called, uh, it's actually number three beside the, the section. God is present by essence, presence, and power as in other creatures. So the first way in which God is present in Christ is as creator. And, and this is how God is present in you. This is Aquinas' formula for God's direct action. If, if that represents God, this represents you, and you are sustained in God making you be. Now, you have absolutely no idea what it's like to make be. That's, that's simply beyond our comprehension. But God is bestowing reality and enabling what is not God to be. And the product of this is you. If I can put it another way, God's relation to you is you. It's not a feature of you. God's relation to you is you. You know, my father's relationship to me is one of the features that makes me what I am. Just as my mother's relationship to me is one of the features that makes me who. It's one of the features. But God's relation to me is not one of the features that makes me be what I am. God's relation to me is me. Okay, so when God acts, I am. There's that direct connection between God and the person. So, in Christ, turning to Christology, there can be full creaturely reality sustained by God. And hence, all the features of creaturely agency are operative in him, except for sin. Not that there's anything wrong with sin. <laughs> it's a, sin is the wrong way to be you. Okay. Sinning is, is actually a failure to be human. And when you speak about Christ in his perfection as a sinless perfection, it means that every aspect of his personal reality is shaped by the divine presence bringing it to wholeness and unity. So among these features are a contingent intellectual horizon. So back to the thing I said at the beginning, when I discovered the historical Jesus 
as a first century Palestinian Jew, I thought that was incompatible with believing in incarnation. In fact, Thomas Aquinas was way ahead of me in saying, no, no, there is full creaturely reality there in all that that implies. And that includes limitation. Christ has to go to the toilet. He has emotions. He is, he is a sexual person. There is a sexual dimension to his reality. Well, we can't say much about it because the data is not available to us. But you would only think that there was no sexual reality in Christ if you did not hold that he was fully human. And so what Aquinas is getting is that you can have a contingent reality, historical limitations, a restricted worldview, and the general features proper to persons in a particular place and time. He is there and then. In other words, Jesus can have the mindset proper to a first century Palestinian Jew. And in the workings of his mind, can think the kinds of thoughts one would expect of a human being in his condition. And indeed, he must have this restriction if creatureliness is his condition. He must have a historical specificity there and then. You can see echoes of Lindbeck's little phrase with all that this implies, including death, because all human earthly creatures die. And therefore, death is built into the script of him as it is of us. Okay? Now, on to the second page. Mode 2. Things begin to build up. According to Aquinas, God is present in Christ by sanctifying grace, as in the other saints. Now this is Aquinas' formula for how God is active by grace, bestowing gifts of unitive knowledge, spiritual insight, prophecy, love, etc. All the spiritual gifts that God bestows upon holy men and women are found in Christ. And the kind of presence God has is that God is a shaping, sanctifying, gift-bestowing reality in the person of Christ. So, God is present in Christ by grace, just as God is active in the minds and hearts of other holy men and women. Now what you will notice in both mode 1 and mode 2 is that the difference between you and Christ is not one of kind. If you like, it's one of degree. It's one of continuity. There is a continuum between your reality, my reality, our reality, and his reality. He may, for example, be at the better end of the spectrum, shall we say. But that's to be expected. So the conscious centre of Christ's personality is filled with an abundance of spiritual gifts. In particular, he has a privileged perception of divine things, in which he's led to an enlightened, infused sense of God's love, by which Christ is able to situate himself at the centre of God's purposes for Israel and the world. And the depth and intensity of his grace-filled knowledge and love of God does not conflict with the possibly restricted conceptual categories available to him in mode one. In other words, there can be a deep engagement with the holiness of God at the same time as the conceptual categories that he uses may be restricted and limited. I mean, the example I would, I would offer you is just it's from the Catholic tradition. Thérèse of Lisieux, the great uh, Catholic uh, Carmelite saint who dies as a young woman in Carmel, age 24. She was a pious girl from Normandy whose spiritual writings are full of, uh, as, as well as a, a deep wrestling with God. The categories she uses are the religious categories of French 19th century piety. If I say they're slightly sugary and, and sweet and, and rather, well, you wouldn't use them now. But she is restricted in the categories of her religious understanding 
but at the same time she has a deep engagement with the spiritual gifts that God bestows on her. Now I want to say the same thing about Christ, that you can have this restricted intellectual, cultural horizon at the same time as there is this deep probing of the mystery of God happening in the mind of Christ. Now the third element, and this is the, the final one, and we'll stop after we've done a, maybe a few more minutes on this. God is present in Christ by personal union. And this is Aquinas' formula for the incarnation. God's word is in union with Jesus of Nazareth. This union does not conflict with what is brought about by the other two modes of divine presence because divine causality does not stand in a contrastive relationship with the causality of created things. There is the full operation of human subjecthood, mind, will, bodiliness, in union with the person of the divine word. According to Aquinas, there's no conflict between radical historical contingency and divine status because there is no conflict between creaturely secondary causality, namely thinking and acting as a first century Jew, and divine primary causality, the actuality of God's word in relation to this human person. God can unite his word to the creature he sustains without destroying the autonomy of that creature's operations. The one who is there can be both God's word and be also human because God is not a thing whose presence and action stands in tension with creaturely agency. The Christian doctrine of creation means that you can be and act, be a secondary cause of events in the world because of God's direct relation to you as primary cause, God making you be. Using an imperfect but useful analogy, the divine word and the human person are not like different chess pieces, only one of which can occupy a particular square on the board, because God is not a thing among other things on the board of creation. The non-conflictual relation of primary and secondary causality makes the Chalcedonian conception of the incarnation possible. And at this point, I have to say to you, this will be part of what you would study. You would then go on to look at the Council of Chalcedon and the great statement that's, that's made there about the, the divine and the human in Christ. So, those are two, I think, very interesting perspectives um, coming from Lindbeck and also from Thomas Aquinas that address the question of why Christian theology takes the shape that it does, the kind of account that it's, that's, that's needed, and, and the, the dynamo at the same time, the controls operating and raises, I think, interesting questions about the relationship of the doctrine of the incarnation and the doctrine of creation. I think, if you like, the conditions for incarnation are found in the kind of relationship that God has to the world. And the incarnation is not a trick, it's not a piece of magic, it's not something exceptionally unusual outside the boundaries but when God embeds his word among us in the person of Christ, God respects the operation of what is there through the relationship of creation to, to, to God um, in the first place. But that will take you on to doctoral level work, and at this point we're still at the very beginning. Okay, <laughs> Let's take a two minute break and then we'll, we'll open up for some discussion on that. Okay. <laughs>